would like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Fortney. We're super happy to have him here because he is one of the world's experts on exoplanet and planet atmospheres um, and, and understanding planets both in and outside our solar system. Uh, he's been a professor at UC Santa Cruz since 2008. Um, and he was a member of the NASA Kepler mission science team. And that Kepler mission discovered over 4,000 planets around other stars. Um, every year he hosts what's called the Other Worlds Laboratory Summer Workshop, bringing researchers um, and experts uh, in exoplanet science to collaborate and create new research programs. And currently, he is a member of the James Webb Space Telescope uh, science teams that are looking at the early data on exoplanet atmospheres, and I'm sure he will tell us a great deal more about that in his lecture tonight. So, All right. Dr. John. Uh -huh. Uh, it's really, really great to be up here. Uh, I haven't been up to give a talk like this in probably about six or seven years, so it's great to be back. Um, my son Finn is here in the front row to see it as well. <laughs> um, so um, uh, in my work, I do computer models of the atmospheres and interior structure of planets, mostly planets around other stars, uh, where we try to compare to the data we get from advanced telescopes telescopes to learn about what planets are like, um, how they're similar or different to planets in our own solar system, uh, how their atmospheres might be similar or different to the planets we have in our own solar system. And um, this is done for a wide range of planets. Uh, it's easier to do for the big gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. It's much harder to do for the smaller planets, uh, more like Earth and Venus. But we'll talk uh, about that today. And so I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz. I run the Other Worlds Laboratory. So this summer we'll be bringing 60 researchers from around the world to the Santa Cruz campus in July to uh, work on new research projects, mostly on, on exoplanet atmospheres this summer. So today, uh, during my talk, I'll probably talk for about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll do some questions. Um, so the first half will be focused on this new telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. And then the second half, we'll be talking about how we are using that and some of the first data we're seeing for exoplanets, planets around other stars. So. Uh, some of you might know that Isaac Newton uh, was the first person to sort of understand uh, how light could be separated out into its colors. And so he did this in the late, uh, the late 1600s, uh, I think a little bit before he started working on calculus and, and gravity. He, of course, just discovered a great many things. Here's an artist's conception. And of course, the, the light that we see from red to, to, to violet is just a very narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so that goes, of course, we see visible light, but if you go to longer wavelengths, that's the near-infrared, mid-infrared, microwave, and radio waves. As you go to shorter wavelengths, that's the ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray. And uh, in modern astronomy, we use all of these different wavelengths of light. When astronomy first started hundreds of years ago, the only detector we had was our eyeball. And uh, that, 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 that we were only able to see a very narrow wavelength range of light. But with modern technology, we can build detectors that can detect any of these wavelengths of light, and all of those get used to trying to understand our universe. And so we use all these wavelengths, and that's all part of this electromagnetic spectrum. And so uh, there are telescopes doing that. Some are, some are ground-based telescopes. Some are space-based telescopes. It turns out our atmosphere is, is opaque for, to certain wavelengths of light, so you have to go above the atmosphere to see some of those. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope, very famous, launched in uh, 1989. Uh, that's mostly in the visible, a little bit to the infrared. There's telescopes, SWIFT is still operating today. SWIFT is a gamma ray space telescope. Uh, on the ground, radio waves, of course, penetrate the atmosphere really easily, so there's ground-based radio telescopes. And today I'll be talking mostly about the J uh, JWST, or James Webb Space Telescope. And that looks at wavelengths of light longer than the wavelengths we can see. 
And the infrared uh, light is really important because it tells us something very different often than what we would see in visible light. So this is, the, this is uh, Orion, very famous constellation. That's what it looks like uh, when we look at it. But if you had infrared eyes, this is what you would see. Um, you, there are certainly the stars are still there, but you also see uh, this sort of cool gas that's permeating everywhere in Orion. Uh, in the Orion region, um, there is uh, that's a, that's a, a region in our galaxy where there's a lot of uh, cool gas and dust that's sort of collapsing to form new stars. And so, uh, if we had infrared eyes, which we thankfully have now with, 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 the, uh, with the modern technology, we can see that there's much more than we can see with our own eyes. And so, of course, infrared light also tells you about heat, temperature, thermal radiation. Here's, uh, I don't, actually don't, don't know who this is, but they have, a, they, have a, they have a black trash bag on their arm for some strange reason. We, of course, can't see their arm. It's under a black trash bag. But if we could look in the mid-infrared at infrared wavelengths of the heat radiation given off, uh, all of us in this room, we walked in, this room was pretty cold, but we're, we're in here for an hour together. We're all pumping out energy somewhat similar to like 100 watt light bulbs. And so by the time we're done, the temperature in this room will be a couple degrees warmer because we're all in it. And so uh, if you use your infrared eyes, that is what you see. Um, the infrared radiation goes right through this wimpy trash bag quite easily. And so you can see uh, this guy's arm. And so it tells us something totally different and complementary compared to what we see with our own eyes. Uh, so this brings us to this telescope. I know this has a lot of words on it, but um, w when, when NASA thinks about what sorts of space telescopes to build, what they do is uh, they actually get input from astronomers, uh, U.S. astronomers, and the, uh, NASA and the National Science Foundation, their, their priorities are set by a group of astronomers that meet every decade or so. And the first group met in 1964, and the last group met in just in 2020, a couple of years ago. And and this is called a decadal survey, a survey of the field once per decade to suggest where astronomy is going and where NASA and NSF should prioritize things in the future. So the 2000 decadal survey wrote astronomy and astrophysics in the new millennium, a several hundred page report. And the thing that they suggested was a next generation space telescope, because by that time, the Hubble Space Telescope had already been in operation for over 10 years. And there was lots of discussion about what, what to do next. And the idea was to build a bigger telescope that could collect even more light, but also that it would have to, have to focus more on infrared light, not just on, on visible light. As some of you know, this telescope got delayed a number of times over the years. The initial thought was that the launch date would be at the end of that decade, 2010. Um, uh, when I sort of got my PhD in 2004, I think the idea was still that it was probably going to launch in like 2012, 2013. And, uh, but it turns out that technology development for such an advanced telescope was just underestimated uh, by the astronomers at the time. And so it took uh, more technology development, more, more funding, but it launched in 2021. And this is, uh, uh, this is a scale model of what it looks like. It is uh, an immense thing compared to, uh, you know, this is, these are many people. This, this shield here is sort of keeps the telescope cool. It sort of reflects the sun's light. That's the sort of like, a, it's, it's about a tennis court sized. Uh, the main mirror here is about six and a half meters across or about 20 feet. Uh, it's made out of hexagonal segments that had to unfold. Uh, the main mirror of Hubble was the biggest mirror that could fit in the, in the bay of, of, the, of the space shuttle because it was released out of the space shuttle and that was 2.4 meters or about eight, eight feet across. So this is much, much larger. And the main science goals for this telescope for JWST, oh, I should mention that it's named after the uh, second NASA administrator. He was the administrator during the, uh, the Apollo days in the 1960s and the telescope is named after him. So uh, the early universe, how the universe sort of came to be, uh, how galaxies form and evolve over time, uh, how young stars form and, and their disks around them that we think make planets, and then characterizing uh, other worlds, the atmospheres of other planets. And that's what we'll be talking about later today in our talk. And that's what I work on as well. 
Okay, maybe I need to, okay. Um, so it actually launched on Christmas morning, um, really, really, really early. I know a lot of people, a lot of astronomers around the world and then on, on this continent who got up really early to watch the launch. I was really confident it was gonna be just fine. So I, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I slept in um, and it worked great. And so uh, this telescope is actually a, a joint project between NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA. And so ESA actually provided the rockets that launched it up into space. It's an Ariane 5 rocket. And while uh, NASA tends to la launch most things down in Florida, uh, Europe, their launch area is in French Guiana, which is a uh, territory at the northern parts of South America. Um, it, it pays off to be relatively close to the equator because then you can use uh, Earth's fast rotation to sort of get yourself going. Um, so that's where they launched from. And um, this is a video. Oh, I forgot I have sound. Okay. They were counting down in French. Okay. Okay. After that, there's just more hugging. Um, so then, uh, uh, one of the cool things about launches in in this in this in, in this decade is they have cameras everywhere, so they can watch cool stuff happening. So this is a speed up of the actual uh, telescope uh, package leaving the rocket. This is a real image, a real movie, but sped up. You can see the little. Psh, 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 psh. It's sort of firing its thrusters, and it starts some un, un, uh, unfolding there. There's some reflection off of the sun. Really, really cool, really cool. And actually the launch went so well that they didn't have to use very much propellant to get it out to where it needs to be. And so the idea was that the telescope probably would have enough propellant to sort of work for 10 years, but it works so well, they actually have enough propellant to keep it uh, where it needs to be for, for 20 years. And so as long as the telescope keeps operating, uh, that's a, it'd be great, it's a really great lifespan. That would actually get me to age 65, which would be just about perfect, I think, for, for, my, for my scientific career. Um, so uh, we here at Earth orbit at one and a hundred, 150 million kilometers or about 90 million miles from the sun. That is actually a unit in astronomy called one astronomical unit because we're in charge. We get to decide what the units are. So one astronomical unit. And it turns out that a great place to put a telescope is at a, a very particular point called L2. There are stable points in our orbit around the sun where if you put something there, it'll tend to stay there. You have to do little tiny course corrections, but it stays. So it's, it, sh it got out to L2 relatively quickly. And out there, um, it actually stays near the Earth. So as we orbit in one year around the sun. Uh, JWST will also orbit in one year around the sun, too, relative, I mean, farther away than us from the moon, but, but relatively close by. And it, it, uh, it can, from there, it can sort of point in any direction it needs to. Of course, it has to point the shield towards the sun, and this, this keeps the telescope cool. One of the reasons to keep the telescope, or the most important reason to keep the telescope cool is that it's, it's trying to see this heat thermal radiation from galaxies, stars, planets. And if the telescope itself gets really warm from the sun, then
then it basically just sees itself, <laughs> and it can't it can't see the the, the the photons, the light from from the things it's trying to see. This is very different from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is actually in a 90-minute orbit of the Earth. It is whipping around the Earth once every hour and a half in a low Earth orbit, sort of like what the, what the it's very similar to the space station orbit, very low Earth orbit. So anytime you're trying to see something, you often get blocked by the Earth every 45 minutes, which is not great, but I mean, it's, 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 it's in principle e easy, to, easy to get there and fix it. But, so this is not easy to get there and fix it, but so far it's working phenomenally well. And so uh, there's been a number of other space space infrared space telescopes. This is WISE. WISE looks at a wavelength of four and a half uh, microns, about 10 times longer than the wavelengths of light that we see. And then there was the Spitzer Space Telescope. That was really important in my career when I was a young astronomer trying to learn about planets with Spitzer data. And then this is what we get from James Webb Space Telescope. It has a much larger mirror. Much larger mirror means you have much better resolution. Those things go hand in hand. This, this telescope was about uh, 0.8 meters across, and this one is six and a half meters across, so it's a much larger collecting area. But in addition to imaging, the thing I'm going to be talking about that's so important about the James Webb Space, Space Telescope is spectroscopy. And so imaging, I think this is this, the, the, it's really easy to get the point across of why this is better. And if you're studying, let's say, galaxies <coughs> or, or young stars, this is really what you want. You want better images, crisper images, to see things in better detail. For the science of exoplanets and the science I do, what we, we want is something else. We want spectra. We want to break that light up into its component colors because that tells us something really powerful about the composition of things in the sky. And so, as, I'm, as you might have learned sometime in your life, you know, some materials absorb light at very specific wavelengths. There's this classic thing where like a, you know, um, uh, a neon lamp, right? They still make those. There's outside its source sometimes. You know, a neon lamp has neon in a tube and they crank electricity through it and it, and it gives off red light at a very particular narrow wavelength range. And so certain gases, certain materials either absorb or emit light at very particular, very specific wavelengths. If you take a spectrum of the sun, you'll see these little absorption lines in the sun spectrum that tell you what atoms are in the atmosphere of the sun. And so if it's an absorption, that's an absorption line. You can also have an emission line where you're emitting light at a particular wavelength. And by looking for those particular wavelengths, you can figure out um, if hydrogen's present, helium, water vapor, uh, neon, uranium, any, anything you can think of uh, has, has particular specific things. People sometimes think of it like a, like a fingerprint. Everyone's fingerprints are different, just uh, in a similar way. Um, but all hydrogen has the same fingerprint. All helium has the same fingerprint, but they're different from each other. And so this is an example. This is not a planet at all. This is a star that's barely holding itself together. Um, this is a great image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, this is an image, but then you can imagine breaking that light up into its component colors. And if you do that in visible light, this image in visible light, you can see certain elements, helium, argon, nickel, iron. This is an example of what we can do by, with spectroscopy. And these are emission lines of hydrogen, iron, nickel, helium. It tells us that these elements are present in the light being emitted by that star. This is a, a, a spectrum right there. So that's the, fing the fingerprints of these different elements. So that spectrum is really important for telling you what's there. It also can tell you how hot the thing is, can tell you what the pressure is at the surface, and also can tell you even about dynamics if something is moving towards you or away from you. So the spectrum has a lot, a lot of additional information that you can't get just from an image. And so we're using that to explore our galactic neighborhood, and that's trying to understand planets around other stars. And so um, 
starting in the, in the mid 1990s, the field has progressed tremendously. In 1995, when I was a freshman in college, uh, that was the first time a sun-like planet, uh, sorry, an, uh, sorry, a planet was found around a sun-like star. So that was the first time a star like the sun, it was found to have a planet around it, another, another star. And so it's been 28 years since then, and now we're up over 5,000 planets known around other stars. Those are all in the Milky Way galaxy. You know, we're in the Milky Way galaxy. That's our collection of about 200 billion stars, give or take. That's, that's, that's our little corner of the universe. And all these planets are really in our sort of local area of the Milky Way. And there's two ways that people typically find planets around other stars or exoplanets. I'm not going to spend a ton of time in that in this talk. The most common way lately has actually been this method called a transit, where you see a planet pass directly in front of its parent star and block out a small amount of the parent star's light. That's called a transit. That also happens in our own solar system. As seen from Earth, sometimes we can see Venus and Mercury pass directly in front of the sun, very rarely. Um, I think the next one for Venus is in the year 2117. So you gotta exercise, take your vitamins. Because um, you, you have to be lined up just right to see that. And so it turns out that this is something, if you stare off in the galaxy and look at hundreds of thousands of stars, every once in a while you'll, we'll see a system that's almost exactly edge-on as seen from the Earth, and we can see these transits. A big planet like Jupiter would block out about 1% of its parent star's light, so not very much. A much smaller planet like Earth would only block out one part in 10,000 of its parent star's light, so a much smaller thing to see. But that's how around, give or take, 4,000 out of the 5,000 planets have been found. And most of those were from this NASA Kepler mission, uh, which stared at one patch of the galaxy for se several years just looking for planets. The other method is called this radial velocity method. This was actually used first, and this has found almost a thousand planets, I think. And this uses the fact that um, when a planet orbits around a star, the star actually also makes a little orbit around the planet. They actually orbit around their common center of mass. So when the planet makes a big circle, the star actually makes a really little tiny circle. And so uh, if you are staring at that star, and then the system is maybe something like this. That's, let, let's imagine uh, us, let's imagine you are looking at this system here, okay? And so what's happening is that star is making a little, a little, a little wiggle, a little circle. Sometimes that star is actually moving slightly towards you or slightly away from you or slightly towards you or slightly away from you. Very, very subtle. It's sort of at the speed at which a human walks. It's a very subtle feature. But what it means is that these, these lines, these absorption lines you see in the star, there's a Doppler shift. So you've probably heard of the Doppler shift with regard to sound. A train whistle going by is high pitch when it's coming towards you, and then a lower pitch when it goes away from you. You can notice this on the highway sometimes if you're like parked in the left turn lane and some car whips by you real fast. It's sort of like a high pitch and it's like a low pitch. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So light, sound is a wave and does that, and light is also a wave and it does that too. So these are the two main ways of finding planets. In this particular method where a planet can pass directly in front of its parent star actually allows you to do something much more difficult but really interesting and allows you to learn about the planet's atmosphere, as I'll be talking about. So... I'm somebody who tries to study planetary atmospheres, so why do I do this? I don't really know. I inherently find it really interesting. Um, so we want to understand the physics and chemistry going on in planets today. What are, what, are the, what are the processes happening? Are they similar to what we see in the planets in our own solar system? And we also want to connect that to thinking about, well, how did this planet form? Are there, is there anything we can tell about it today that might tell us about how it formed or how it evolved over time or how it's going to keep evolving over time? And it turns out that studying the atmosphere is one way to be able
able to do that because it's sort of the stuff we see at the surface. It's the stuff that's most easily visible. If we look at Jupiter, what we see is Jupiter's atmosphere. We don't see Jupiter's interior. We just see the, the parts at the top that we can see. So atmospheres are often all that we have that's accessible. Ooh, a very bright one. So this is not to scale. The planet's is really big to make it easier to see. <clears throat> but for these transiting planets that pass directly in front of their parent star, um, I should mention that although our planets are relatively far from the sun, we're in a one-year orbit. Our closest in planet is Mercury. That's in an 88-day orbit. The planets I'll be talking about today are sort of um, unusual in that there's, they orbit in like a few days. So they're in like three to five day orbits. So they're very hot because um, they're very close to their parent star. They're warmed up. So these planets are sometimes called hot Jupiters. Yeah. They're not going to have much of an atmosphere. Well, that's a great question. So it turns out that the giant planets, if you're a Jupiter-like planet that close in, you have plenty of atmosphere because if a planet like Jupiter is 300 times the mass of the Earth, it's a huge object. It's mostly hydrogen helium gas. And that's very stable in a 12-year orbit. Turns out it's actually pretty stable in a five-day orbit too. It's just a lot hotter. Um, and one of the things we'll be looking at at the very end is a, a, a small planet in a very close in orbit too. So the planet, when it passes in front of its parent star, it blocks out, like I said, about 1% of the parent star's light. But you can imagine that the planet, if it has an atmosphere, that would be like a, like a little annulus shape around it. And you can imagine light from the parent star passing through that thin annulus of atmosphere on their way to, on their way to us looking at it. And if there's molecules in that planet's atmosphere that are absorbing certain wavelengths, certain colors of that star's light, we might be able to see molecules in that planet's atmosphere. The planet may well also pass directly behind the parent star. And I mentioned these planets are often pretty hot, the ones we're studying now. And so they're giving off this infrared heat radiation. So the planet will pass behind the parent star disappear, you'll just see the star, then the planet will reappear again. And so if you take a spectrum of the total amount of light that's coming from that blob of light, at some point it'll be a mixture of the planet and the star, the planet will disappear, and then you'll just see the, pl the star, and then the pl and this planet will reappear. So you're looking for a tiny difference in the total amount of light when the planet is not being blocked. That's called the secondary eclipse, or the occultation. It's also possible, one of the things that people are going to be doing with James Webb over the next year is looking at that orbital phase variation. Here, when the planet passes in front of its star, we're seeing the night side, right? And here, we're seeing the day side. If we think the night side's colder and the day side's hotter, if you could stare going from night to day, you might see that total amount of light change as you see more and more of the day side and then go back to see more and more of the night side. So I mentioned we want to get a spectrum. So this is the basic idea that this is a, sort of a weird cartoon, but there's, there's the parent star. The planet's going to pass directly in front of the parent star. We're thinking about light from the star that's going to be skimming through the planet's thin outer atmosphere. And we imagine breaking that up into its component colors, looking for absorption features due to atoms or molecules. In this particular um, example, uh, the artist was, was thinking about looking for sodium. It turns out, we actually can see sodium with the Hubble Space Telescope in the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's, uh, this, it's actually the this, this same yellow sodium lines from, from like city street lamps down in San Jose, uh, the, 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 those, those, those yellow lines. It turns out that these hot planets have uh, sodium vapor in their hydrogen atmospheres, and so that's something we can see. This is the basic idea if we want to look for molecules and atoms in the planet's atmosphere. 
And so I mentioned before that there's a wide range of wavelengths of light, right? This is the electromagnetic spectrum. Longest wavelengths are radio, microwave, infrared. That's where the James Webb Space Telescope is operating. Shorter wavelengths is Hubble. There's a visible light, really narrow wavelengths we can actually see, and then ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray. This plot is really too busy. I took this straight out of a paper I was on, so it's not really great for public consumption. But the point is that if you look at these infrared wavelengths, these are all longer wavelengths than we can see, really interesting molecules like uh, water vapor, H2O, ammonia, carbon monoxide, methane, carbon dioxide, all of these uh, molecules all have absorption features in these wavelengths. And so uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is mostly going to be looking from one to five microns, where a lot of these different molecules absorb these particular colors or wavelengths of light. So methane, for instance, has this really weird sort of um, finger-shaped blob thing at around three and a half microns, and no other molecules have that same feature. So we would know it was methane. Water vapor has a bunch of features at a bunch of different wavelengths, all in orange. Nothing else looks like water vapor. We'd be able to tell that that's what it was. Um, and so one of the things we want to do is take an inventory of what elements and molecules are in planetary atmospheres. In our own solar system, we've done this via spectra and also via sending probes. So the first part I'm going to be talking about is giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. One of the things we've measured is the abundances of some of these noble gases, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus. For Jupiter, we know a lot of these because we actually sent an entry probe that dove into Jupiter's atmosphere in 1995 and actually measured in the atmosphere the abundances, sent the data back, and that's sort of the ground truth for Jupiter. It's actually really hard to measure the atmospheric abundances of some of these other things in Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune because they're very far from the sun. Their atmospheres are very cold. A lot of the interesting molecules we'd like to see are actually frozen out into clouds way below the atmosphere that we can't see. So a really cold planet like Uranus or Neptune, we've measured the carbon abundance, and that's it. We have no other inventory, basically. And so the nice thing about these really hot planets on close-in orbits is that their atmospheres are hot. A lot of these molecules are there. They're visible. They're not frozen out into clouds like they are in our, our very cold giant planets. And so this is uh, an artist's conception of a transiting planet passing directly in front of its parent star. The planet's artificially a little bit big, just for fun. Uh, these sort of close-in gas giant planets usually block out about 1% or 2% of their parent star's light. And this is an artist's rendering of a planet called WASP-96b. It turns out that a lot of the planets that are found around stars, um, the stars, not, not all stars have a name, actually. And so it turns out that if you build a survey for planets called the Wide Angle Survey for Planets, then when you find your planet, it, you can, you can brand name it after the name of your survey. So this was the 96th planet found by the WASP survey. B means it's the planet. The star would be WASP 96, capital A. And so what we're imagining that is thinking about, can we see molecules in the planet's thin outer atmosphere as it passes directly in front of the parent star? Imagine a, a little annulus of atmosphere around that planet looking for molecules in it. And so what, would, what you would see is this is, uh, this is real data for WASP-39b, similar planet. This is the relative brightness. So this is 98%. So this planet blocks out about 2% of the parent star's light. 2% blocks out. And it's blocked out for mm, about an hour and a half. This is uh, 2.30 to four, five o'clock. So th this planet's in like a three-day orbit. It's really whipping around. So when it passes in front of the parent star, it's only passing in front for about two hours. And so 
th uh, sh a short wavelength is 3 microns, and then 4.3 and 4.7. So these are different colors of infrared light, longer wavelengths. And what we can see pretty clearly if we zoom in down here is that if we look in our green wavelength, 4.3 microns, more of the star's light is being blocked out. That is, that is deeper. If we look at a red wavelength, 4.7, there's a lot of scatter, but you can see the green dots are all basically all dimmer than the red, are all deeper than the red dots. So the planet's atmosphere blocks less light in this reddish color, and it blocks more light in that greenish color, okay? So what we're seeing is that at different wavelengths of light, that star, that, that planet's atmosphere is more or less opaque. So it's telling us the atmosphere is absorbing some colors of light better than other colors of light. And so if you do this at a bunch of different wavelengths, at a bunch of different wavelengths from three microns to five microns, this is wavelengths about seven or eight times longer than we can see with our eye, it turns out that there's a big, huge bump at about four and a half microns where a bunch of extra light is being absorbed. And it turns out we know here on Earth in the laboratory you can measure it, carbon dioxide is a really strong absorber at 4.5 microns. So this had been never been seen in a, in a um, this has of course been seen in Venus's atmosphere and Mars's atmosphere and Earth's atmosphere, as everybody knows. Uh, but this had never been seen in a planet or around another star. So this is the first time this molecule had been seen in an exoplanet's atmosphere. This was this dis disco discovery last summer of carbon dioxide in this hot Jupiter. And so this is part of a, of a group that I'm a part of. It's actually led by my colleague, Natalie Battaglia, down the hall from me at UC Santa Cruz. It's a collaboration of about 300 people from around the world um, using some of the first James Webb Space Telescope data to look for a, the, some of the most interesting, uh, easiest to observe transiting planets. This is uh, just for scale. You can see how huge the James Webb mirror is compared to uh, you know, people, very small. And this is um, uh, a photograph of somebody's laptop at, in Santa Cruz last summer during my OWL workshop. We were the first scientists in the world to see this data come down. And uh, one of the grad students there is Zafar the Rustamkalov, who's a grad student at Johns Hopkins University, but he was an undergrad with me in Santa Cruz. He quickly, over the course of several hours, converted all the all the messy stuff the telescope sends you to make it into a spectrum. And boom, here at four and a half microns is this huge absorption feature due to CO2. This was really, really exciting. It was a little bit less exciting for me. That was the one week of my life I had COVID, so I was back at my house. But I got to follow along on Zoom, which is the next best thing. Um, and so this is uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This bump here is due to water vapor absorption. This is another one due to water vapor. So these are all things seen right away within the first few hours of the data coming down in July. And uh, this is a sort of a cool little animation that shows you how much better the day, the first data was compared to what we had before. So this is um, how much light is blocked out. So this is like 2.15% of the star's light being blocked out, okay? And what we had before was from the Spitzer Space Telescope, we had been able to measure this in two really broad wavelength bands, this plus and that plus, but what can you say from these, from two data points? But with hundreds of data points going along, you can clearly see this absorption feature due to CO2. So it was very much like night and day from what you could do before. And so people were all happy. There was high fives, clapping, lots of excitement. I was typing along at home on, on Zoom. Uh, but that was a really, really special, really fun time. And that's Natalie Battaglia. She's the, the PI of the program, the primary investigator. And that's uh, Zafar, under, uh, my former undergrad. This is Mike. He's a professor at Arizona State. Sarah is at University of Arizona. And then David's also at Johns Hopkins. 
And so we wrote it, we, we as a team wrote up a paper that we put in the, this journal uh, Nature, the first spectrum of an exoplanet from James Webb. And um, basically it's all the things I mentioned before was uh, there's uh, this big carbon dioxide absorption feature, there's water vapor over here. But as we dug into the data, people also noticed this thing over there. And nobody really knew what to make of that. It was this little additional absorption feature, and it was like, well, is that real? Well, it looks real. It looks like there's really something there. And so people spent, uh, later on that week, uh, as the days went by, a lot more effort went into that. And it turns out in the models we had, you know, CO2 absorbs at four and a half microns. Uh, CO is in red that absorbs at these longer wavelengths. Water vapor is in light blue. These wavelengths, we couldn't find anything that had this little bump at around 4.1 microns. And it was like, what is that little bump? What is the little bump? Not in any of the models. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are on Slack or, or Discord, you like you know, chat about things with your, with your friends, but as, um, people use Slack, and so we had our own wild theory speculation channel to try to figure out what this was, because it's a bunch of us all around the world. And so it turns out there's, there's databases that chemists and other folks have made where you can look up a molecule and figure out what wavelengths of light it absorbs at. And we needed to find something at 4.1 microns, so people were going through any molecule they could think of, just And it turned out we eventually found one, and it's a molecule, sodium dioxide, SO2. And the thing about SO2 that's really interesting is that it has an absorption feature right at 4.1 microns, and the amount you need is about five parts per million. So you need about five well, five parts per million in the atmosphere to be there. Not very much, right? And it turns out that if you run a really sophisticated model for one of these atmospheres, this is, this is like the amount, so you have more on the right, less on the left, on a, lo on a log scale. This is pressure in the atmosphere. This is like the top of the atmosphere. This is the bottom of the atmosphere. This pink is SO2. And it turns out you only make it in a really sort of narrow range in the atmosphere. It's only made by photochemistry. What you need is you need ultraviolet photons to break up water and to break up hydrogen sulfide. That's the thing that we thought was supposed to be there. And it turns out you end up making sodium dioxide, SO2. And so it's only made if you have really high ultraviolet flux. So it's only made for these planets very close to their parent star. And so this is sort of a schematic of what happens. This is the first time it was seen in an exoplanet atmosphere again. So the normal thing for sulfur is H2S, hydrogen sulfide, and then you have water. Uh, the ultraviolet photon... Ooh, I need to drink my water. Hold on. Uh, I should also remember I'm wearing a microphone. I don't need to yell. <laughs> uh, so there's a pathway where you start with water vapor getting broken apart by the ultraviolet light. And different fragments of that water molecule end up attacking the hydrogen sulfide. And through this pathway of the OH part and the sulfur part, you bump along. And at the end, you get sulfur dioxide, SO2. And this uh, was actually predicted by a, uh, a young researcher at UC Riverside just a year earlier. But not a lot of people were aware of his paper. But he was on the team amongst the three hundred of us and he got all of his proper credit and he led a separate paper just talking about this pathway and then the, the, the discovery of sulfur in this planet's atmosphere. I'm also part of another group called the Manatee Program, um, which is an acronym, which I don't actually remember what it stands for anymore, but we do have this cool logo involving a manatee and uh, the James Webb mirror. And um, uh, the thing that we're trying to do with the Manatee Program is look at cooler and cooler planets to understand as we go to cooler and cooler temperatures, how does atmospheric chemistry change? With the hot Jupiters that are maybe like 1,500 or 2,000 degrees, that's data we can get pretty easily with James Webb. Jupiter is very cold. I forget in Fahrenheit, it's probably like minus 200 or something like that. Very cold, it's like 125 Kelvin. So with the Manatee program, we want to look at a wide range of planets at a bunch of different temperatures. 
And so one of the first planets we're looking at is WASP-80. I've mentioned this WASP thing over and over again. WASP found a lot of planets. And so one of the great things we were able to, to see in a paper that we're going to be submitting next week is we have the first detection of methane in a transiting planet atmosphere around another star. And the cool thing about it is that we actually see the methane when it passes directly in front of the parent star in transit and transmission. And that's when we see the methane as well when the planet passes directly behind the parent star. And I mentioned this weird sort of methane finger, and we can actually see that in the spectrum, the real data is in black. And the, the best fit model is in blue. And if you take out the methane, you get a, a model in orange, which is a, a bad fit. So basically, what we're, what, we're say, what we're saying is that we can find another new molecule in another planetary atmosphere. So for our inventory of what planets' atmospheres are made of for these gas giants, we found CO2, SO2, uh, and, and methane. I think later this year we'll probably find ammonia in some cooler planets and some other molecules like HCN and acetylene. These also should be photochemistry products in some of these atmospheres. And so over the next few years, um, Oh, this is five, sorry. Right now we have observations of about five planets. Um, but over the next few years, this will grow to something like two or 300 of these gas giants, these Jupiter mass, Saturn mass planets very close to their parent stars. So we'll be able to understand them as like a whole class of objects going from five to two or 300. This is just, these are just artists' conceptions of this wide menagerie of planets. We don't really know that they're this color. Uh, we'll, but we'll, we'll, we eventually will be able to figure out what color they are, but these are just artists' ideas. Um, WASP-39b was the planet we just talked about. There's others, all sorts of other ones. Uh, so we want to understand how the chemistry of these atmospheres changed going from hot to cold. Okay, so in the last seven or eight slides, I want to talk about those really challenging observations we're also trying to do to understand the atmospheres, or lack thereof, uh, pl oh, I gave away the punchline maybe, uh, of planets around um, small stars. So um, I mentioned that the key thing is being able to see the light that's blocked out of the parent star. And so if you want to see, if you want to check if a, if a small planet has an atmosphere, with this technique, you can't do it around a sun-like star. The sun-like stars are too big. But if you find a tiny, small star, then you can try to see if a small planet has an atmosphere or not. And so that's been done for one system so far. So this is how big the sun is. There's a system called TRAPPIST-1. So TRAPPIST-1, this star, is only 8% the mass of the sun. Its brightness is one one-thousandth the brightness of the sun. It is a small, feeble red star. But the crazy thing about it is that it has seven transiting planets that are all around the same size as the Earth. Seven. And so if you stare at it over the course of, this is about, I guess, two or three weeks in October 2016, 1.000 is how bright the star normally is, but you see all this fuzz. This fuzz is when the planets are passing directly in front of the parent star for a couple hours at a time, and they block out something like 1% or 2% of the parent star's light. And these, 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 this repeats over and over and over again. So the closest in planet orbits every day and a half. That's these magenta diamonds. The next one orbits every, let's say, three days. The furthest out ones are orbiting every, like, 25 days. So it's like a whole little compact system of seven approximately Earth-sized planets, all camped in real close to this really feeble campfire. So this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. Again, all artists' renderings of what the planets may or may not look like. And the crazy thing about it is that this is to scale. So this is our inner solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So there's this concept called the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot, not too cold. And so Earth, we're, we're right in the middle of that, which is good, right? <clears throat> 
We can have liquid water at our surface. Mars, kind of at the outer edge of the habitable zone, a little bit debatable, probably too cold. Venus, too hot, but we're just right. But if you're a really tiny, faint star, your habitable zone is going to be really close in. Turns out that these small, faint stars actually often have very small planetary systems, too. And so this is um, uh, enlarged a factor of 25, this little thing here, and there's planets B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And so what we did is we looked at planet B to try to determine if it had an atmosphere. So it's really close in, sure, but it's not crazy hot. Some of these hot Jupiters I talked about were something like 2,000 degrees. This, this star is so faint that this planet, we were thinking it was maybe four or 500 degrees. So we were trying to see if it had an atmosphere. So that's the idea. So that's TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1b is the one we're interested in. So we're looking for trying to see if there's any if there's any absorption features, carbon dioxide, anything. We're trying to see something in its atmosphere. And so what we did is we watched the planet pass directly behind its parent star, looking at that heat thermal radiation. This is what we saw. This is over the course of uh, just three and a half hours. The planet passes behind the parent star for about 45 minutes. And what you see is that the total amount of light goes down when the planet's directly behind the parent star, that's just seeing the star. And then when the planet reappears, the total amount of light goes back up again. So we're seeing that planet reappear. And using how deep that dip is, we can take the temperature of the planet. We can tell you how hot the, the part we can see is. And the idea was, if the planet has an atmosphere, atmospheres are reflective. Atmospheres are inherently reflective. Think about water clouds on Earth, hydro um, sulfuric acid clouds on Venus, uh, Jupiter has bright ammonia clouds. Clouds and atmospheres always reflect the light. So the idea was if we saw a planet's temperature that was relatively cool, that would tell us it probably had an atmosphere. It turns out that rocks are really dark. Rocks are terrible reflectors. So if the planet's like a bare rock, it's going to be absorbing a lot of light and reflecting very little of it. And so it would be hot. It would glow hotter and brighter. That was the experiment that we did. And it turned out we took the temperature. The planet ended up being around 500 Kelvin or around 450 Fahrenheit. And we were thinking that if the planet had an atmosphere, it would be down here. And it turned out the temperature we measured is basically the maximum temperature it could possibly have, meaning that it really does not seem to have an atmosphere. It's, a, it has, it's some sort of bare rock that's absorbing almost all the light from its star and glowing in the infrared. So for this planet B, the first one that's going to be looked at over the course of the next year and several years, no evidence for an atmosphere for TRAPPIST-1b. And we think there's a reason why is that um, some stars have a very complicated history over time. So for this, this is how bright your star is as a function of time. And it turns out the sun is relatively constant in its lifetime. There's some bumps and wiggles, but the sun has been relatively constant in its brightness over billions of years. The thing about these really small, faint stars is that they're small and faint today. They're much fainter than the sun. But when they form, they're really much brighter than they are. So this planet that's 500 degrees today, when it first formed, its star was really brighter, maybe like 100 times brighter. And that may be what sort of blew off all of its atmosphere, because during the time it was forming, its star was 100 times brighter than it is today. That's our working assumption right now. All right. So these are my takeaways. I'm happy to take any questions. I told you about four planets, I think, tonight. This year, in James Webb's Cycle 1, about 65 planets are going to be observed to understand what their atmospheres are like. Uh, next year, Cycle 2 got decided about a month ago. There'll be 55 additional planets. That's all in the first two years. I mentioned the lifetime of the mission is going to be, we hope, something like 20 years. So my expectation is that we'll probably get to look at 
500 or 1,000 planets uh, over the next 10 or 20 years. For giant planets, where we have lots of great targets already, we can really build up a comprehensive understanding of all sorts of trends in their atmospheric chemistry, what they're made of. That's something that we will do. For these smaller, rockier planets, it's much more challenging. There's not as many targets. It's much harder of an, of an observation to make. It takes more telescope time. But I think over that same time period, for maybe 10 or 20 planets, we'll be able to do this sort of first characterization of do they have atmospheres, yes or no, why or why not, and try to figure out um, what they're like. So uh, thanks for coming. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, there's a, a group of astronomers, our, our peers, so um, there's a group that runs the telescope for NASA, and they're in, in Baltimore, and so they convene uh, a bunch of panels. So there's a, a, panel for, a panel for stars, for galaxies, and we all submit proposals. And we submit proposals, and the panels read these proposals, and the ones that seem the most scientifically compelling win the telescope time, and the ones that are deemed not as compelling do not win the telescope time, and you can try again next year. And so for this cycle, the, the, the oversubscription rate was about six to one. So, so if, you set, if you sent in six proposals, on average, you'd get one, but you also could get zero or two, but yeah, six to one. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, are you planning on looking at things that take more than like a year? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, yeah. So the planets on longer period orbits are inherently much harder to find. Um, basically because for this transit technique, you need the system to be almost exactly edge on as seen from Earth. And so for a very close in planet, your margin for error is much better. For a very, so there are some planets known on those longer period orbits, which are inherently not as hot and inherently maybe a little more like our solar system's planets. So um, there are plans to do that. So I'm actually leading a group that's looking at a Jupiter Saturn mass planet that's in a 250 day orbits. And so that one we expect to be in a lot of ways similar to Jupiter. It's only about twice as hot as Jupiter as opposed to 20 times hotter than Jupiter. And so uh, those, those systems are in inherently very high value because they might be more similar to our own planets, um, but there's just not very many targets and they're often um, fainter planets where the observations are a little more challenging. The transits last something more like, I think this, that transit of the planet I mentioned is going to last about 12 hours instead of 45 minutes. So it, it takes longer because the orbit's slower. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you, there were like, there were four different labels for, for your spectrum data. I don't know, like Tiberius or mm -hmm. something, something. What, what are those? Are those teacher? Teacher? Oh, yeah. Kids today will 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 name their pipeline anything. So, so uh, yeah. So so these are different software, custom written software packages to turn the raw data from the telescope into a spectrum. So. so so they're, they're just the names that the teams gave them. So some are, I think, quite elegant, like Firefly. Some are like something some grad student thought up, like T-shirt. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's just that's just the name. Yeah, yeah. So they're all the same data source. They're different projections. Yes, they're different custom software packages that uh, I think they're all in. I think they're probably all in Python actually these days that are that are converting the raw data into the into the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the slide where you showed the seven planets. Yeah. Um, 
you figure out how, how many times they go around their sun. Yeah. But how do you figure out the distance? It's a great question, yeah. So, um, um, so yeah. So this this is this is transiting every let's say two and a half days. So um, from Kepler's law, Kepler's laws. There's three Kepler's laws, and and one of them tells you that the period squared is proportional to the distance cubed. He, he worked this out in 1610, um, just just from raw data, and then and then uh, Newton actually figured out the mathematics behind it. So if you know the mass of the star, which just by looking at the star we can determine its mass, by measuring the mass of the star and measuring that orbital period for how often it repeats the transit, you can work out the distance from the star. Because the closer in you are, the faster you orbit; the further away, the slower you orbit. So that's the connection between the two. Oh, that's a great question. So the orbits are very close to circular, but they're not perfectly circular. And that actually is really helpful. These planets are so closely packed in that they feel not just the gravity of the star, they feel the gravity of each other. And that perturbs their orbits. So it's, they, don't, they don't orbit exactly like clockwork. Sometimes they transit a little bit earlier than expected or a little bit later than expected. And you can actually build up a really complicated mathematical model of the interactions between the planets. And that actually allows you to measure the masses of six of the seven planets from that, from that it's called transit timing variations. So that's how we know that they're potentially, but that's how we know that they're, they're, they're rock iron planets, is that they have a density very similar to the Earth, because we can measure their masses and their radii. Um, yeah? There's a known around the Earth planets, uh -huh. in which the deeper down you go into that system, the more you get away from the Earth. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so the deeper down you go into a gas giant, the, it's the, hotter, the hotter it gets. And um, the, we can use that idea quite well in the solar system. So it turns out that a gas giant's atmosphere is most transparent at, at, at radio wavelengths. So when we look at Jupiter using radio telescopes, we can see down way below the clouds. And that can tell us about what molecules are there in those deeper layers. So that's been done in the solar system. For, the, for these exoplanets, I'm sure that's something we'll be able to do eventually, um, but uh, I'm not aware of any telescopes on Earth that are, that are sensitive enough to see that very small emission from the, given that the planet's so far away from us. But that's worked out really well in our own solar system. I'm sure we'll be able to do it someday, but maybe it might be a few decades from now. It's just, it's just really challenging. I think we can only take one more question. Okay. Have to wrap it up. Sure. Um, yeah. So, um, what other things are we trying to learn about the exoplanets other than the atmosphere? Yeah. Um, for James Webb Space Telescope data, um, that is predominantly focused on atmospheric studies in addition to looking at um, planet forming disks around very young stars that are just forming you know we I mean all, all of the planets in our solar system all orbit the same direction that the Sun rotates right so we think we formed in a disk but um, there's very very few disks that have been studied in a lot of detail. So like the, the initial conditions for forming planets, that's really barely known. And so that's one of the things people are using this telescope for is to probe that. Um, there's other examples, like um, people study uh, the demographics of planets, like where, you know, different masses of planets, do they exist? How commonly around different kinds of stars or different distances from stars? So that's where finding more more and more planets going from 5,000 to 50,000 is really important. But that involves sort of telescopes different than James Webb. That's not really optimized to find planets. It's more optimized to study the planets we've already found. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, sure. All right, thanks.